Welcome to another RDWorks Learning Lab. Now in the last session we looked at focus um, and focus was a prelude to the subject that a lot of people are very interested in me getting stuck into which is the compound long focus lens where we have the prospect of being able to increase the cutting ability of our short one piece lens by adding another lens above it. Now that's fine if you've got the C-type lens tube such as I've got where I can stack one lens above another with a distance of about probably three or four inches between them. So this won't apply to everybody but it might encourage you to think about maybe getting a C-type lens tube rather than maybe a new tube if we can prove that you can get a lot more cutting power out of a compound lens system. Now I'm going to stop at that point and say look if all you're interested in is jumping in the car, turning the key, putting your foot on the accelerator and going that's about as much as you need to know about a car for most people. What you know about lenses so far is probably as much as most people want to know. You put light through a lens, it focuses it down and makes it more powerful and then you cut with it. Now if that's all you want to know then bye bye. Today is going to be a bit of a science lesson which is why I'm here in my office. I'm not going to be outside in the freezing cold talking to you guys or, or even learning for myself because I've got a pretty good idea of what's going on and I'm going to drag you up to speed as well. But hey, I don't know all the answers. I've still got to go out and do some experimentation. But what I want to do is go through what I always do, the theory of it before we start. Now today is going to be a, I'd say part one and most of it's going to be a bit of a a science lesson I suppose in a strange sort of way to explain how I've arrived at this conclusion that there is a weakness or a hole in lens theory that we can exploit for use on our machines. Now, I think anybody could exploit it if they realised and knew what was going on but from all the research I've done I can't find any writing on it. So we're going into virgin territory certainly as far as our hobby community is concerned. And now as I've told you many times before, I'm not a physicist and I'm not an optical engineer. I'm just a straightforward mechanical design engineer, production engineer, quality engineer. I've done all sorts of engineering jobs in my lifetime. So I've got a great deal of general experience to pull together. I don't know whether it's one of my other talents or whether it's a weakness. But one thing I can assure you is that I know I have scepticism actually embedded in my DNA. Now that makes me a very curious, nosy and disbelieving person. Which is why we are here doing what we're doing. Because I don't believe what I've been taught. So we'll start off from square one and we'll look at some of the issues and gradually work our way through so that you can understand exactly where I'm going to and why. We are going to look into some science subjects in this session but don't let that put you off because I think you probably know from the way that I've tackled subjects before. I try not to dumb them down. What I try to do is to make them understandable and basic. You're not going to go into full scientific concepts, just ideas. But ideas are enough to enable you to build a jigsaw puzzle without having the picture. Let's make a start. I've stopped a video here that I did back in 2016, almost uh, five years ago. And this is what I believed about lenses at the time and what most people have been fed to believe about lenses. This is standard lens theory. OK, we've got three types of lens here, one and a half inch, two inch and 2.5. And the difference between them is this dimension here, which is called the focal length. And as you can see, we put a parallel beam of light in the top and that parallel beam of light is compressed down to something here, a very narrow section here, 
which is called the focal point. And the focal point at the focal point, theoretically, you get these what they call spot sizes, which is the little area at the centre here where every beam of light passes through that hole. Now, people come away with the idea that a beam of light is curved like this and that there is a narrow neck. It's not true. This is just the outline of all the beams that are passing through there. Light does not travel in curved paths unless it gets affected by things like the sun and, and the huge gravitational objects. Light for us travels in straight lines. So this is only a pictorial representation of the path of all the light rays that are passing through this spot size. Each lens has got a different focal length, but it's also got what they call a different working range, focal depth. And for a one and a half inch lens, it's quite small, look, plus or minus 0.4 of a millimetre. And then it goes up to plus or minus 0.7, and then plus or minus 1.15 for a, a two inch, two and a half inch lens. Now, I haven't put the four inch lens on here because at the time that I was doing this, four inch lens was, it was unbelievable. I wouldn't think that we could ever use a four inch lens with a 50 or 60 watt tube because, you know, we didn't have enough power. That was my belief at the time. And why did I believe that? Well, I believe that because of this spot size thing. Look, that's 0 0.075, which is about three hairs thickness or diameter. And then 0 0.1, um, which is four thousandths of an inch. And this one, 0 0.125, which is about five thousandths of an inch. So basically we've got three thousandths of an inch, four thousandths of an inch and five thousandths of an inch. It's very, very small numbers. But the point is, those very small numbers have got significantly different areas. And let's just take a look. If I regard that one as being an area of one, which is what I've done here, then this has got an area which is 1.8 times more area. And this one, 2.8 times more area. So basically, one, two, three, very crudely. OK, so if I put 60 watts through there, I've got 60 watts per unit area. Let's call that something power density. OK, this is the idea. So now if I put 60 watts through this one, which has got twice as much area, the power density is no longer 60 watts per unit area. It's 30 watts per unit area. Technically, I've got half as much power that I'm putting into the area. And this one, I'm only putting 20 watts because it's about three times the area. So the idea that I came away with at this stage five years ago was that a one and a half inch lens was much more powerful than a two or a two and a half inch lens. Now, this was an idea that stayed with me for a long time because it was probably another three years, four years maybe, before I started to seriously look at how lenses worked and how they cut. Now, I make no bones about the fact that I give things to Cloud Ray and in return, Cloud Ray will send me what I need for my experimentation. They were very kind and they gave me lots and lots of lenses. So I was able to play with lenses, different sorts, different shapes, different focal lengths. And one of the things that became very obvious to me in some of my work. You can go back and check this in some of the sessions that I carried out with lenses. So say, for example, I could cut 10 millimeter thick material with that at maybe six or eight millimeters a second. Putting a two inch lens in allowed me to get probably 40 or 50% more cutting speed. Hang on, that doesn't make sense because we've got less intensity of power. We're going to do less damage so how is it possible to get a faster cut out of a two inch lens with the same watts as I did out of a one and a half inch lens? And then blow me down, I nearly fell off the edge of my perch when I found that I could get even faster with a two and a half inch lens. This just didn't make sense. There's something wrong somewhere. What was going on? All my belief in lens theory was blown out of the water. And it's taken me a long time, maybe two years or more, of research 
and I can't find any research that gives me the answer to my questions and gradual experimentation to try and come to a, a very satisfactory conclusion so that I know very confidently now what I'm doing with lenses. You know enough about lenses to know that you've got one inch, two inch and two and a half inch lenses and that you can do various things with them. You do various things with them by experimentation, but you don't understand what's going on. Now, another part of lens theory, which has caused me a great deal of puzzlement, despite the beam expanding fairly rapidly after the focal point, I could do things like this. Look at that, with 30 watts, as I found out on my Tangerine Tiger just recently, in one second, I can burn a parallel hole through 25 millimeter thick acrylic. How is that possible? Lenses work by a mechanism, a scientific principle called refraction. But before I talk about refraction, we need to talk about, I think, the speed of light, because there is a strange phenomenon behind this principle of something called refraction. Now look, you can see I've got a 12 inch one foot ruler here, 300 millimetres. Now, how long do you think it takes light to travel from that end of the ruler to that end of the ruler? <laughs> I know it's a silly question, but hey, maybe the answer will surprise you. A billionth of a second. That's how long it takes for light to travel, 300 millimetres. Give or take a few millimetres. So those scientists among you that know the answer exactly, don't write to me. <laughs> These are round numbers and they work for me and they give you the impression that, hey, light travels pretty bloody fast. Okay, now, technically it's 300 millimetres or a foot in a billionth of a second in a vacuum, i.e. that's the speed at which light travels in space where there is nothing to get in its way. When there's something getting in its way and the something could be glass, water or some other denser substance than air, it slows down. Yeah, that's a surprise, isn't it? You can actually slow light down and when it hits something denser and generally the something denser will be apart from my head possibly light will pass through things like glass or water it slows down and the speed of light slows down approximately by a third the blue bit this light here is passing through a sheet of glass and as it hits the glass it changes angle and speed and then when it comes out the other side of the glass, it resumes at exactly the same angle. So fast, slow, fast. And these angles that the light comes in and goes out at, and the effect of change, angular change inside the medium that it's passing through, are all defined by something called Snell's law. Now, you don't need to know that. That's, that's something for the physicists, physicists and the optical engineers that want to calculate exactly what these angles are. We're not going to look at that. We just want to know that when the light comes towards a denser material, and let's call that a big angle, shall we? This is a, a big angle because the speed of light is big at this point in time. And then when the speed of light slows down, relative to this line here, which is something called a normal, and a normal is something, a line that is 90 degrees to the surface, that's a reference line. So relative to this reference line, the light is coming in at some big angle. When it gets into the material, the angle, this pink angle here, gets less, so we get a smaller angle as the light slows down. So we've got a big speed, big angle, small speed, small angle. It's just my 
silly pictorial way of remembering it. It's not a scientific way. Okay, and then we look at the problem from the other way round. What happens when the light travels from this dense medium back into a less dense medium? Well, here we've got light coming in to, onto this flat surface and here is the 90 degree angle, the normal, and now we've got the same pink angle that we had coming in this way because nothing has changed. So we've got a small angle because it's in a dense medium going out into a less dense medium where the angle gets big again and the light speeds up. So we've got a big speed, big angle, small speeds, small angles inside. Okay. Now, that's a very non-scientific way of describing refraction. It gets very interesting because I'm going to show you something else now. This is the basic principle upon which lenses work. Now I hope you can see how this uh, measuring stick is no longer useful. It's got a bend in the middle of it now. Look, you can see that nicely now. How the water is actually appearing to bend the metal. That's what refraction is. This object that I put into the water was not bending it this way, as I predicted and warned you. It's bending it that way, away from you. Here's what you saw. You saw a bend in the middle of the object, but you knew that the object was completely straight. And what was actually happening was this object appeared to be here. Here's the light coming up, hitting the surface and refracting off at an angle. And that's what you're seeing. You're seeing this refraction angle, whereas in fact, the light is actually appearing to cause this shape to change here. And if you've not encountered this stuff before, it's going to take a little bit of getting your head round it. So you might like to go and do some research on Google. Just put refraction in and you'll get all sorts of information. So we've seen what happens when light hits a piece of parallel sheet of glass, for example. It passes through the glass and comes out at exactly the same angle. OK, now. As we start decreasing the angle of incidence or the angle at which the, the light hits the glass, when the light hits absolutely normal to the surface of the glass, nothing happens. When we've got a beam of light that comes in at 90 degrees, it hits the surface of the glass, slows down to a slow speed, and then when it comes out the other side, it speeds up again. It's still parallel to what it was when it went in. So it was 90 degrees going in, 90 degrees passing through and 90 degrees coming out the other side. So there was no effect on the beam because the piece of glass was parallel. Now, lenses are funny things because they are not parallel sheets of glass. So we've got a beam of light coming in at an angle. Here's our normal. We're coming in with a big speed, big angle. Once we're in the material, it's small speed, small angle. So this time we've got a piece of material that looks like this. What happens now? Well, here we've got a completely separate situation of what we had here. The first thing we have to do is to draw a normal and the normal is going to look something like that. So the light is striking the surface of the glass with a small angle because it's slow and it's going to turn into a big angle as it gets back to big speed again. But that angle there, x, is the same as this angle here, x. The rules remain the same. It will always cross over the normal and it will be from a big angle to a small angle. This one will cross over the normal from a small angle to a big angle. And hey, look, we're no longer passing out the lens like this at the same angle that we came in. We are coming out at the same angle that we went in 
X and X. And that's basically what happens with a lens. And instead of that straight line, I was to do this. Not very good. That's supposed to be a normal to this curved surface. And that's the bottom face of a lens. So we'll look at that in a little bit more detail very accurately. Our cheap lenses that we have to use are very simple, easy to make, cheap lenses. Our focusing surface is part of a sphere and here I've got the sphere. Okay and in this particular example we're right out towards the outside of the lens and we have our blue high speed big speed light beam coming in. Here it is here 48, 41 degrees relative to the normal of that surface and the normal is from the centre of the sphere out to the surface. It then gets changed to a much smaller angle just here and the light slows down and it then comes out relative to another normal which is just here at the same angle that it went in 41 degrees in 41 degrees out and relative to the center of the sphere here we have 5.41 now we'll take exactly the same lens but this time instead of the beam coming in towards the outside diameter of the lens the beam is going to come in here and hit the surface of the lens just there. Now, in this case, it's coming in at seven degrees relative to the normal. And again, the normal is from the center of the sphere to the outside. Then, because this is a shallow angle, we shall get a much longer, but shallower pink line which will be relative to a normal and as we come out the bottom surface we shall come out the bottom surface here like this as you can see we've got very little change now and this time because we're closer to the center we have no longer got 5.4 our focal point now is 6.6 .6. so the distance that we are away from the center of a lens determines the focal point at which it will cross over the center line the central axis of the lens so already we can see that just this spherical geometry has got some errors built into it. You cannot get a good single focus point from a spherical surface. There is always something called spherical aberration and we finish up with lots of different focal points depending on where the beam is relative to the axis of the lens and that was what I attempted to show you in the previous session. The fact that there was there was no such thing as a single focal point for a lens. So here's the lens we've just looked at and you can clearly see in this instance I've drawn it in a slightly uh, more complete manner the difference between the rays coming through from the outside and the, and the rays coming through the center take on a focal point which is beyond those rays which are coming in from the outside. Now this is a very uh, exaggerated lens form but let's just call this shall we a one and a half inch lens now if you were working with parallel rays of light and the light was uniformly spread over the whole of that area let me come back to my picture here where I said look we were assuming that we've got uniform light 
and therefore the energy density within each of these spots was predictable. No, this is the problem. It's not predictable. We don't have such a thing as an energy density that we can define for that lens. The light in that lens is not uniformly distributed. Here we've got a distribution curve of intensity of light within our laser beam. It's a Gaussian distribution, something called a normal distribution. And normal distribution or Gaussian distribution has got predictable properties. And as I explained to you in the previous session, 70% of the power of the beam or the intensity of light in the beam is contained within this 30% at the center of the beam. But look, we've got a very, very high intensity right at the central part of the beam. Now, I hope I've spent long enough trying to persuade you guys that it's light intensity that stimulates molecules, that heats the molecules up, and the molecules change into something else. They effectively self-destruct. They get heated up by light waves into a higher state of excitation. And that higher excitation state means a higher temperature. And they would eventually do something when they reach a critical temperature. The higher the intensity of light, the more rapidly you can stimulate the molecules. And so where is the highest intensity of light? It's right at the center here. And look what's happening here. That light is not focused at this focal point. This 70% of energy is focused somewhere else. Now, it may well be that this lens has been designed with this focal length, but it isn't the same as the power focal length because the power is contained within a smaller part of the beam. And that smaller part of the beam is working closer to the center axis of this lens. And the closer the beam gets to the central axis of the lens, the more it's going to move its focal point further beyond this nominal position. I tried to demonstrate that to you clearly in the previous session, where I moved some 15 or 16 millimeters beyond the focal point, and there was still power enough to damage a piece of MDF. And I'm now beginning to explain to you how that phenomenon occurred. Here is a lens with, for example, say, a 12 millimeter diameter beam. And here's its Gaussian distribution. This is the same beam that we're now going to make only say five or six millimeters diameter. 60 watts, still 60 watts. But what have we done? We've squashed the power into a smaller beam. And look what we've done to the Gaussian distribution. It's still a Gaussian distribution, but look what's happened to the peak the peak relatively, and these are just diagrammatic, these are not real numbers, but the principle is that as you reduce the beam diameter, you're actually making the intensity at the center of the beam much higher. Now come back and say it again, light intensity equals damage. That's why you're not doing much damage at the outside of the beam because the light intensity out here is very, very low. The overall power is contained within the whole beam, but 70% of it is contained in the center, but 70% also contains the highest intensity part of the beam as well. So as we squash this beam down into a smaller diameter, so we increase the intensity of the beam. I mean, that's effectively what we're doing when we send the beam through the lens itself. We're squashing it down and we're forcing 60 watts into a small footprint. But it's not evenly distributed in that small footprint. It still contains this Gaussian distribution. So by the time we squash the beam right down to its spot size, 
we've got incredible intensities sitting here. But they're not uniform intensities, they're, they're intensities of this form, but they've got huge spike of intensity. It's, it's not out here, but, but what I'm saying is this graph effectively gets very high and the intensity grows and grows and grows. And the more squashed you make the beam, the more the peak intensity is. That's why you'd expect a one and a half inch lens to cut better than say a two inch or a two and a half inch lens. So it still makes sort of sense at this point in time. But we know that it doesn't make sense because proof <laughs> goes way beyond theory. Now I'll take you back to the first scribble. Here we've got a beam which approaches the surface of our glass at 90 degrees. It passes through the glass at 90 degrees and passes out the bottom at 90 degrees. There is no refraction on that beam. It passes cleanly through the glass. The only thing that happens along the way is the light slows down. Bear that straight line in mind. And let's look at these pictures here. Let's zoom in on that one to start with. For that light ray there, look, it's approaching the surface at that sort of angle. That's how it's bouncing off the surface. And this one in the middle here? Well, look, that's zero. That's passing, this one is passing right through, completely unhindered. Here we've got the smaller beam. But our 70% now is not working at this angle here. It's working at a much shallower angle. So there's less focusing taking place the closer I get to centre. Or there's less focusing taking place as the angle of approach gets less. OK, now there are two ways that you can change the angle of approach for this beam. One is to make it closer to centre. So if I moved that beam, that 70%, and squashed it down even more, I would have an even smaller angle of incidence as it hits the surface. And that means that it will have a much longer focal distance out the front beyond the nominal focal point. OK, so that's one way that you can change that distance. Let's go to the other extreme which is the four inch lens. Here we've got the 12 millimeter diameter beam, say, but because this is a four inch lens, it's got a much shallower spherical shape. It's got a much bigger radius. And so consequently, this section here, where the rays get deflected towards each other and cross over at a focal point, Look, we've got a very small amount here. And the closer we get to centre, we've got almost nothing. And when I reduce the beam size, of course, that makes this powerful bit very, very powerful because I've got hardly any focus at all taking place. So I get a lot of rays that pass out a huge distance beyond the focal point. Now it's beginning to make sense. Why? a four inch lens has got more cutting power than a one and a half inch lens. So it's got nothing to do with this average energy density that we talked about earlier. It's got everything to do with the way in which the light approaches the surface of the lens, the angle of incidence of the light onto the lens. The closer it gets to centre, the less angle of incidence, the longer the point of focus for those rays will be. And when I get to the very, very centre, there's only one ray that's passing right through the axis of the lens and you cannot focus a single ray. By definition, in theory, that goes out to infinity. But there is such a small amount of power in that one single ray that it doesn't really matter. It's those rays just either side of centre that have got huge 
focal lengths on them that are causing the damage because they are containing the most amount of power. And now we have an explanation as to why I can do that with a four inch lens, 25 millimeters deep, 30 watts. One second it took to pierce through there with a parallel hole. That is the logic that goes behind the idea of putting a seven or eight inch lens beyond our four inch lens to bring the beam down to a much smaller diameter before we even put it through the four inch lens. My real quest when we get out to the machine is to find out what size beam have we got approaching this lens normally and what size lens, what size beam are we going to reduce that to when we put a seven and a half inch lens a certain distance away from it. All right, we're doing an amplification by decreasing the beam size, not as I was advised with the beam expander, increasing the beam size. I explained last time about why increasing the beam size was perfectly valid for trying to get a small spot, but not perfectly valid for trying to get a deep cut. We're going to stop there at this point in time, having bored you to death with theory. I think you've had enough. Your brains need a rest. And in the next session, part two, we'll go out to the machine and we will try and prove the point with lots of experimentation. And we'll see what time it takes to burn through a block of 25 millimeter material. And this time we'll base it just purely on time. And we'll take a look at the shapes of beams that we're producing. I mean, we can see that very clearly so thanks for your time and patience again today. On this occasion, I've been able to do all this theory work in the nice warm office here. Oh dear, I need another top up. So look, I'm gonna to have to leave you now because I've got an urgent need to fulfill and I'll catch up with you in the next session. Bye for now.